Hey, Tom Stelauer here, and today we're going over almond flour alternatives. Now, this video isn't about throwing almond flour under the bus. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down different flours and give them a different rating in respective categories, like which one's best for fiber, which one's best for overall antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera. So spoiler alert, we're going to cover almond flour, we're going to cover coconut flour, we're gonna talk about tapioca flour, cassava flour, and also quinoa flour. So I don't mind telling you them because there's a lot of interesting details when we get into the nitty gritty of it. Hey, I do wanna ask, please do hit the red subscribe button and then hit the little bell icon so you never miss our daily videos on this channel. All right, let's go ahead and jump right in. So almond flour, my concern with almond flour is that we're using it so much these days. We're seeing it in everything. It's a low carb alternative. So I don't want people to start developing a tolerance to it or start developing any kind of issues with it from an immunoglobulin kind of immune system standpoint. So let me first off say that almond flour is actually quite great, all right? There's nothing wrong with it. I still give it the winning award in the category of most available, cost-effective, and universal. Okay, the issues that I have with almond flour, of course, it's very caloric. Yes, it works on a ketogenic diet, but the bigger issue is that it's very high in omega-6 fats, okay? So when you start making things with almond flour all the time, you're gonna throw off your omega-3, omega-6 ratio unless you're really making a concerted effort to have more in the way of omega-3s. So don't shy away from almond flour. Just be aware that there's a ton of different dishes out there that have a little bit too much, okay? Now, almond flour is cool because it's very, very high in magnesium, which we definitely need on a ketogenic diet. And they're also gonna tell you, it's overall got a good amount of minerals otherwise too. It's still got a good amount of potassium, good amount of manganese. It's all around a pretty darn good food. It's just that fatty acid profile. Now, you will hear people say, oh, well, there's phytates in almond flour. Now, phytates or phytic acid usually make it so that you don't absorb minerals or vitamins along with it. They chelate. Well, the good news is with almond flour, you don't have the skin, okay? So basically, the phytic acid is removed. So that problem is null and void. You don't have to worry about it, okay? But what else can you have? What other kind of flowers do you see out there? Obviously, there's tons. Hazelnut flour, we're gonna see all kinds of different ones out there. Brazil nut flour I've seen recently. Sure, those are great, but they're just nuts, okay? So it's easy to investigate. Let's talk about coconut flour for a second. Now, coconut flour wins in the mineral category. In my opinion, it is rich in the electrolytes that we need. Lots of manganese and tons of potassium. Why do you think people talk about coconut water being an electrolyte replenisher? Coconuts just have a lot of electrolytes in it. So when it comes down to just an overall mineral profile, I definitely give coconut flour the vote. Now, coconut flour is somewhat keto friendly. See, there's usually like 11 grams of carbs in a serving, but usually seven to nine of those carbs are gonna be fiber. Now. That fiber is somewhat resistant starch and somewhat just purely indigestible fiber. So is it going to do a lot of good for you rather than just push things along? Eh, it's kind of negligible. It's a little bit hard to tell. So what I would usually recommend is divvying it up, like mixing almond flour and coconut flour. That way you kind of reduce that almond flour impact. So maybe take half the amount of almond flour and substitute that other half with coconut flour. Yes, your carb count will go up a little bit, but it's still gonna be keto friendly because overall the net carbs are gonna be fine. So coconut flour wins in the mineral category. Now we move into one that you're seeing all over the place. One that I'm quite frankly a little concerned with, which is tapioca starch. Tapioca starch is still technically a flour, okay? Although it's something that you would only use in a small amount. Now what tapioca starch is, it is a compressed and kind of basically consolidated form of the cassava root. Okay, so they take cassava root, they extract a the starch, and they squeeze out the pulp and everything like that, and then they dry it and you're left with tapioca. Tapioca is very universal in the sense that it's very good for drawing water in. So you'll see it in a lot of things that need to have texture. You'll see it as a binder. But you'll also see it as a quick way to be able to, I don't know, give body to a food that's gonna be on a ketogenic lifestyle because you don't need much of it. Now there are a lot of carbs in it, but technically it's what is called a resistant starch. So a resistant starch doesn't really get absorbed into the bloodstream as blood sugar. Okay, it's still, it's kind of a fiber, kind of not, but basically what it is, is it's a starch that gets broken down by larger bacteria. Those larger bacteria break it down into pieces where intermediary bacteria come in and break it down into short chain fatty acids. That's complex stuff. The point is, we're seeing way too much tapioca starch. Okay, way too much to the point where we're gonna start developing an issue with tapioca starch just like we as a society have developed an issue with gluten because we have too much of it. So I just encourage you to exercise caution. However, it does win in the texture category. When it comes down to bang for your buck as far as texture goes, tapioca is gonna win. That's why it's used so much. It draws water, it gives smooth volume so you don't have that grainy texture that you might get with, say, coconut flour. 
FYI, all the flowers that I'm talking about today, you can get at special pricing down below through Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a sponsor of this channel, but they are awesome and they are who I use when it comes down to like pantry goods and things like that for groceries. So I've assembled a keto box, a fasting box, hormone optimization box, thyroid box, all kinds of things. So it's like you're going grocery shopping with me and you can get the things that I recommend. So definitely want to check them out if you want to check out some almond flour, some hazelnut flour, some of these other more kind of um, off the wall flowers that you might not normally see and we won't even talk about in this video. Okay, so check them out after you watch this video at the link down below. So now we move into the fiber winner, okay? cassava. Now cassava is so similar to tapioca. You might be thinking, well, does it really matter? Well, tapioca is different. Tapioca was the extracted starch. Cassava is the whole ground root. Very important thing to note. Go ahead and just buy cassava flour because if you try to make it yourself, it's risky. Cassava is technically toxic until it's cooked. It has high amounts of cyanide in it. That's totally true. If you were to eat cassava root, you'd probably get sick. You'd have to eat a lot of it to really have a cyanide issue, but you could get sick. So anyway, it needs to be cooked, needs to be roasted, whatever, and then put into a flour. Now it wins in the category of fiber simply because it still has those resistant starches that you see in tapioca, but it's combined with other fibers that are there from the root too. Okay. So you still get some of the skin, you still get all this stuff. So you have a wide variety of fibers. So when you're just trying to just build up an overall, just good, diverse gut biome, cassava is very, very solid for that. Is it good to use on keto? not in large amounts because the carb content is still pretty high. It's going to give you the most similar effect to wheat flour as probably any of the ones that I'm talking about. Almond flour is heavy, so it doesn't rise the same. Cassava, if you combine it with the right things, you can actually get it to rise. You can actually get it to make pretty good baked goods. But just note, you're going to need a good amount of it. It's not going to be keto. But if you're not keto, it's great because it's still going to give you that good gut biome diversity that you need because you're feeding all kinds of different gut bacteria because of the wide variety of fibers and resistant starches. The next one is the winner in the antioxidant category. That is quinoa flour. Now quinoa, some will say it's a grain, some will say it's not. Some get bloated from quinoa, some do not. I know lots of people that have tremendous success with quinoa flour. Personally, I get bloated with it, but that's just because I've always had an intolerance to it, even when I eat straight up quinoa. It's probably because it has some of the prolamin cross reactions, story for a different day when it comes down to gluten. Not gonna go into the gory details on that. It wins in the antioxidant category because it's super high in vitamin E, high in vitamin C, high in quercetin, and high in these other flavonoids that are gonna help support an anti-inflammatory response within your body. In fact, it's been shown to modulate what is called cyclooxygenase enzyme 2, which is the same kind of thing that ibuprofen modulates. So yes, it has a good anti-inflammatory and ultimately just an overall good effect on the body from antioxidant capacity. Is it keto friendly? No, not necessarily, but it is definitely low glycemic and it's a great strategy if you're just trying to change up your flowers. So I would recommend if you're not keto, a nice little combination of cassava and quinoa flour works tremendously well just to support your gut biome, but then also give you the antioxidant capabilities that you need to live a healthy life. I'll see you tomorrow.